we have today two eminent speakers, Dr. Guy Whitney and Mr. Ken Blades, illuminaries in their field, and Dr. Karnakaran, principal scientist, IIHR, will be joining the panel discussion uh, that follow the presentations. And uh, uh, on, after this, this session is over, we have another session on human-animal conflict, which is a significant challenge that is being encountered by all plantations today. And uh, we've, uh, we've, uh, we've, uh, we've, uh, we've invited here an, an expert speaker, Dr. P.S. Isa, who's the chairman of the Ar Aranyakulam Nature Foundation, who will be addressing this, this audience on that. So that should also be a very interesting session. So with, with this, let me, it's my pleasure to hand over to our past president, Mr. M.P. Cherian, under whose, uh, during whose term many of these initiatives were, uh, were started, and he will be uh, conducting the proceedings for today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you all for coming uh, to this avocado cultivation session on workshop on avocado cultivation and plantations. Uh, it is my privilege and honor to uh, introduce our speakers. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Guy Whitney. He's got a very extensive uh, biodata, so I will just uh, be brief about his, his experience in this field. He's got over 40 years service and experience in avocado, citrus, tree fruit, wine and vegetable production, nursery operations, harvesting, post-harvest quality control, storage, shipping systems, extension, and research program leadership. He's, worked, he's working with South African and, and California and Washington state growers, packers, shippers, marketing organizations, extension personnel, scientists, as well as uh, government, provincial, and local agencies. Uh, Dr. Guy Whitney comes from academia. He started his, his career uh, as a lecturer and then went on to be part of the faculty in the University of California. Uh, he is currently Avocado Project Manager, Great Back Avocado South Africa. He's also a technical consultant with Westphalia Fruit South Africa and general consultant with Navo Avocado Zambia. Uh, before that, he has worked in many companies uh, like Macadamia Nursery, Sun Pacific Company, and was the Director of Industries Affairs in California Avocado Commission. So without further ado, uh, let me welcome Dr. Guy Whitney and request him to make his presentation. I'm a little shorter. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I really, uh, first of all, would like to give my appreciation to Aparsi for inviting me and showing me such great hospitality uh, since I've been here. And uh, I'm sure in the week that follows, um, I'll continue on my journeys visiting some of you at uh, various uh, parts of the plantation industry uh, so that we can make an assessment of your area and its suitability to growing avocados. So I've titled my, uh, my talk this morning, Avocado, Ecophysiology and Suitability for Indian Production. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what I mean and define ecophysiology for you because it might be a new word to some of you. I had a professor at the University of Natal uh, in Durban who uh, is one of the, the, the authors of the book Avocado, the, its botany, production, and uses, uh, the most sort of comprehensive book on avocado. And he was very, very adamant, and he drummed into me that you won't understand how to grow avocado unless you understand its ecophysiology. That is where it comes from and what it's adapted to. It's going to be a little bit uh, of... Okay, so avocado originates in the tropical lowlands and the, also the, the mountainous highlands of Mexico and Guatemala and the West Indies, or the islands around the Caribbean. So they are, thank you, 
There are three different races of avocado. West Indian from the lowlands, which is the, your typical, what people here are calling local avocado, although it doesn't actually come from India, of course. It was introduced here. And then uh, the Mexican and Guatemalan types, which are often hybridized and of which most of our commercial varieties consist of. Just very brief history, because I know that many of you have heard a uh, history of avocado from Dr. Arpea in a previous talk. But just even though it has been around as a, as a cultivated uh, crop, uh, as a backyard tree um, in Central and South America, uh, for about nine, th nine to 10,000 years. It really wasn't until the early 1900s that the um, first commercial orchards were established, and that was in Florida and California and Hawaii almost simultaneously. And then there was a tremendous amount of... Uh, there's not a way you can uh, just scroll slightly so that the, the slide... Otherwise, I'm going to... No. <laughs> it's okay. It's all right. I'll, I'll make sure the presentation is, is available for you guys, um, but you, you can see most of, of the thing. So the current situation now is that it's a very young crop as a commercial crop. You know, we're talking about 150 years old. So there's tremendous diversity out there. And it's only in recent years, since the 50s, that the crop started to settle down into a few important varieties. And what I would like to say here now is other industries have done the school, paid the school fees on avocado. It's not necessarily necessary for the Indian plantation industry to pay those school fees again. That's a very important concept, and I'll get into that a bit more. So the most important uh, varieties commercially are the black-skinned varieties. About 70% of all the fruit that's moving around the world turns a dark color when it ripens. And of those, Hass is the most important. Hass dominates international trade. About 80% or between 80 and 90% of the fruit moving around the world from one country to another is Hass. And Hass, it was a chance discovery in California amongst some seedlings that were growing in a, in a backyard. There are new Hass types that have been bred which have some advantage, advantages over the original Hass. That includes Lamb Hass, Gem, Maluma. There's a new variety that's out now called Luna, Harvest, Surprise, and a few others. But the point I'm making here is Hass dominates world shelves, if you like, retail shelves, sales. And there's a good reason for that. It has a moderate size, it has exceptional flavor and quality, and it's very suited to retail. It's not terribly well suited to, to growing because it has some problems. It switches itself down at, uh, at about 35 degrees. And when it does that, some of the fruit gets sunburned. And if there are a number of days, you know, if, if say there's 30 or 45 days above 35, the fruit starts being small. You don't lose fruit, but the fruit size suffers because photosynthesis is, is hindered at temperatures above 35. These newer varieties, lamb has and gem, can tolerate very high temperatures into the 40s and continue to photosynthesize. And so the yield, on lamb has and gem, and in fact Maluma too, is, is higher than has generally, a little higher, because it's not hindered by these high temperatures. And we don't have a, a small fruit problem in either of those next three, lamb has, gem, and Maluma. The letter after the variety is the flower type. I'll talk a little bit more about A and B flower types. Avocados uh, have perfect flowers. They have male and female parts but they exhibit a phenomenon called synchronous dichogamy, which means they, they open twice in two consecutive days. The first day they open female, and the second day they open male. On the A-flower type, types, 
They open on the first day in the morning female and in the afternoon of the second day they open as male and on the bee flower types they open in the afternoon of the first day female and male in the morning of the second day. That's an, uh, 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 an ecological or, or um, uh, an, an adaptation to encourage cross-pollination in the wild. So it's, it's something we've inherited from the natural botany of avocado, of Brasea americana, and uh, we have to live with it. Fortunately, I've been looking everywhere I go at the flowers here. Most of the flowers I'm finding are A flower types, even in the, in the local varieties. But I see from about uh, half past 11 in the morning till about 2.30 in the afternoon, they're both flower types are open. So we are even, even you know, so, so while, the, while the, the, the one flower is opening um, male in the afternoon, for example, the female is still shutting down. So, so there is some crossover within the single flower type. I don't think we're going to have a, a t tremendous need for B flower types planted within the A flower types, but we'll have to do that that research to see later on. And then there are, oh, sorry, seems to be, you seem to be losing ground every time on these slides. Um, is it possible to just op open, open the PDF? Oh, oh, you've got it, okay, okay, okay. Could we, I'll just ask you guys to, to do, that's easier. So, so the, the rest of the Luna is a new variety. It just got released by the University of California. It is an, a Hass type, looks just like Hass, very highly productive, and is a bee flower type. So I would encourage those who are bringing plant material in that they try and uh, uh, make a deal with, with Westphalia. It's Westphalia owned, I believe. Um, I'm, not, I'm not actually certain of that. Uh, Harvest and Surprise are have fallen a bit out of favor because of uh, uh, erratic yield. Next slide, please. Okay, the green-skinned varieties, which make up about uh, the other 20% of world trade, if you like, in the United States only make up about uh, 2 or 3%, uh, include the very famous Fuerti, which was the first variety ever importantly commercialized, which is a bee flower type, but a very difficult tree to grow. A big tree that only starts producing in the fifth year and uh, is a little bit difficult to manage, has very uh, erratic yields. Reed is a green skin that's uh, a very, very um, prolific, high yielding, but rather a large fruit. I think reed would be a super fruit for the um, Indian local market because it's high quality, has a thick skin, it chips quite well. Uh, it, it has a lot of the characteristics of the local varieties, but Im a vastly improved quality in terms of the thickness of the skin and the flavor. And there, the others listed, I'm not going to go through them, but uh, you will have this uh, presentation to look, look at uh, later. But Fuerti, Reed, and Pinkerton are the most important green skin varieties uh, worldwide at the moment. Next slide, please. Okay, so where does avocado come from? It's, uh, yeah, okay. So it's to, 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 to understand this crop, uh, you need to understand that it comes from the rainforest, basically. And it's an understory tree. It's not a climax tree. So it's a late succession tree in the forest in, and it's uh, understanding this native environment is very important in understanding how this tree grows and a lot of work has been done that done on this on the physiology of the tree so you find avocado forests of the type of varieties that are now very important commercially in the high montane the mist belt if you like the cloud forests of Mexico and Guatemala in the native habitat. And as late succession understory trees, they're not true climax forest trees. So the immediate thing you would think is, yay, we can plant these in the shade. But here's the thing. Next slide, please. Okay, there's just a definition of ecophysiology. 
It's a study of the physiology of the tree and related to the ecology of where it comes from. Let's talk about some of the things that we found that are related to ecophysiology. The tree architecture is adapted to competition with big trees. The architecture. So what happens as soon as the tree senses shade, it starts elongating and trying to get out of the shade. Okay, it, that's the adaptation. So it's not suited to be under shade. It's adapted to competing with sun spots in the shade. Branching is completely unpredictable. So it's not like an apple tree where you can train it into a, a set uh, pattern where you, you see fields and fields of apple trees that look, all look identical. Very difficult to make avocado trees all look absolutely identical because the branching is very erratic. It branches wherever they f there's sunlight, another branch will be formed. There's a potential for two to four vigorous growth sh uh, flushes per year. It's got large leaves, so very, uh, very um, efficient leaves with photosynthesis. The leaves are saturated at about half the available sunlight. So a leaf in the sun is saturated at about half of the available light. But what that means is the leaves inside the canopy are able to carry on photosynthesizing in quite dark conditions at, at half the amou available amount of light that's on the outside. A very, sorry, a very important thing. Um, sorry, uh, could we go back one? Very important thing uh, is the leaves are waterproof. So the, so the tree is with this understory tree in a dripping cloud forest where the other trees are dripping moisture on it. The leaves cannot be permeable because they cannot lose nutrients. In those cloud forests, sorry, the nutrients are very, very um, difficult uh, to come by. So the trees are scavenging for nutrients. And so the leaf is completely waterproof and when drips drip on the leaf, you don't want any of the nutrients in the leaf then to leak out. So water doesn't get into the leaf. So that's a clue, and a clue that's been proven over and over and again by, by researchers in, in California. Avocados don't take up nutrients by foliar sprays, and yet everybody uses foliar sprays. It baffles me, absolutely baffles me, but that's, anyway, that's the case. Okay. They're fairly shade-tolerant leaves, as I said, very short-lived if they're excessively shaded. The trees are self-mulching, which is a very important thing. They accumulate organic matter on their own. They make their own organic matter under the tree. And the roots, their own roots, grow up into that leaf litter near the surface and scavenge for nutrients. The roots are very shallow, very unusual in the plant kingdom. They have no root hairs. So these roots are not adapted to stripping nutrients off clay colloids like other plants are. Root hairs generally increase the absorptive area of a root near the root tip and also will, they release hydrogen and strip off cations off clay colloids. So these, even though they're very efficient uh, shallow feeder roots, um, they, they have an extremely high oxygen requirement which is one of the problems with avocado. If they get asphyxiated with water, the tree dies. So that, that's something to keep in mind all the time. Hoarding and recycling of scarce nutrients is common. There's zero salt tolerance in Mexican and Guatemalan types, very good salt tolerance in West Indian types. Okay, so it's, what do we know about uh, the ecophysiology as it relates to reproduction? There's a very high light requirement for the, in, in, the, the, flower, the initiation of flower buds. So in late summer, generally, when the light's high, all of the shoots and buds that are in full sun will initiate flowers. The flowers won't, won't appear for till an, another three months until the flush comes out, but they have a high light requirement. So what happens when we put them with competing shade trees is you don't get as much flowering as is required for commercial crop. 
and you end up with half or a quarter of the potential yield that this tree can produce. I know that sounds like a contradiction of, of you know, its light requirements, but it wasn't, it didn't evolve to be a crop tree. It evolved to survive in this, these very competitive forest environments. So in full sun, you get heavy peripheral flowering, up to a million individual flowers on a, on a mature tree, and those flowers are opening every day over a period of three to six weeks, even though each individual flower only lasts for two days. And if that flower is, is uh, pollinated, then it sets a fruit. Flowering is synchronized by cold and or drought stress. So there are going to be, I've looked at your weather data and uh, seasonality, there are going to be areas that are going to have two flowerings here where you have the dry, the dry period and the cold period uh, slightly offset. And when that happens, you, will get, you probably will get two flowerings, a major flowering and a minor flowering, but that's not a problem. It's very inefficient flowering. It's very carbon, mineral, and water expensive. So out of a million flowers, you might get 250 fruit. It's enormously expensive for the tree. So at that time of flowering, it needs a lot of water, it needs a lot of nutrients, it needs everything in place for you to set a proper crop. They're very inconspicuous flowers, pollinated by, by small insects. And of course, you have the A and, a and uh, B flower types. On, uh, on the other rest of the reproductive things, there is um, a, a fruit drop, uh, two fruit drops generally a year. Uh, one when the fruit's about the size of a pigeon egg and then one a little later of larger fruit. That's just self-regulation so that the tree doesn't get into carbohydrate um, um, stress. The fruit is energy expensive, highly nutritious, high in healthy fats, vitamins, minerals, and a full component of amino acids. And that tells us something about how it evolved. Remember that uh, also, it's got a, a large, very large seed in, you know, in the plant kingdom, and it's a protected seed. It's poisonous. So no, nothing can eat an avocado seed. It's not fed on by anything. It's not the food of any creature. So the, it's got very concentrated reserves in that seed that will support a seedling for up to a year without requiring any sunshine. That's important for its adaptation to that environment in the forest, on the forest floor. And fruit softening and ripening only occurs when the fruit is stripped from the tree, okay? Very advantageous for growing avocados. I used to tell California avocado, avocado farmers that they were the, growing the easiest crop in the world to grow because you've got a six to 12 week window in which to harvest a particular variety. Not like peaches where you literally have three days or table grapes where you might have three or four days or apricots where you may have one day when the fruit's ready and needs to be harvested, you have a very broad window. Okay, next slide. That, that just gives a, 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 a picture of the flowering early fruit set and at the top there, day one, when the flower opens as female. If you look in the middle of that flower, I don't know how clear that is for you guys, but you can see the pistol there with the the little ovary at the bottom there, right in the center, and the stamens, the male uh, flower parts, are pressed down on the petals. That's when it's in the female phase. So on an A flower type, that's in the morning of the first day. In the B flower type, that's in the afternoon of the first day. And the second one uh, shows the male flower opening, and that's always on the second day, and on the A flower type, it's in the afternoon of the second day, and on the B flower type, in the morning of the second day. And there you see the stamens have lift up, lifted up, and then as the, the, the dew, or if you like, uh, of the morning dries down, the, 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 the pollen gets to a certain relative humidity, and it suddenly releases from the stamens. It's, it becomes airborne, but very short-lived. So there's pollination by insects, little small insects, uh, small bees, flies, and wind, and water. Okay, next slide, please. 
So how do we, all of this knowledge, how is it applied to how we plant avocados and the modern avocado orchard and the technologies we use and the management we use and, and how avocados are managed today or planted and managed today in the world? Next slide. Okay, successful establishment and growing up on avocados really is based on seven pillars, in my opinion. The right climate. We know we have that here. In fact, we, I, I would bet we probably have the range of climates in India where you will have avocado production in some part of India of these good high quality varieties throughout the year. Because if you, if you look at location, south and north, and elevation, low and high, you've got a full range of climatic conditions that you really could stretch this out with the right varieties, so you'd have year-round supply. Good soil. Having a good soil is essential. This cannot be planted in any soil. If the, if the soil is too wet or too, uh, too heavy, the trees might initially grow, but eventually they'll get into trouble with Phytophthora. You need proper site preparation. Uh, it used to be that farmers would clear a field and, and just dig holes and, and plant the trees and everything would grow. Nowadays, there's a whole very expensive, relatively expensive uh, way of preparing the, the site that almost all of the industries worldwide are following. Proper post-planting care and long-term management also essential. If you get everything right, this is an easy crop to grow because of the, 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 this long period you can harvest it. If you get even one of these things wrong, it can be an unforgiving crop, unfortunately. The first thing that, uh, that you see almost universally now uh, worldwide is either ridging or terracing. Now I know this, I, I, I'm, I'm going to be quite blunt with you guys. I'm going to tell you the best way of growing avocados, um, the way that the world, the, the, the technologies the world is using in the, in the top industries. I'm not getting uh, paid for, for being here. I mean, I'm gen probably is generously uh, uh, paying for my travel, but my time I'm, I'm giving up for you guys for free. I have no hidden agenda. I'm not trying to make money out of anybody. Um, so I'm going to be blunt about, I, I sincerely believe that some sort of terracing or ridging or mounding is required for success in these very high rainfall areas uh, of India, simply because that high root, root oxygen requirement of these roots, uh, even transient water logging, complete water logging of the soil, and I don't mean at, at field capacity, I mean beyond field capacity, where it's waterlogged, will deprive the roots of oxygen and they will die and the trees will go out of the rainy season into the dry hot season um, in, a, in a bad situation and will rapidly collapse. And I think uh, some of the plantings I've seen is probably not Phytophthora, it's simply root asphyxiation that, that I've seen where trees have died, particularly low down in the fields. It, Phytophthora does go for stressed roots so there probably is an interaction there of Phytophthora cinnamomai and waterlogged roots. But, yeah. Next slide. So the first one was of terraces, and this is uh, a ridging machine working on, on the farm that I work at in South Africa. It's just a, a four-wheel drive John Deere pulling a, an implement with offset discs that, that uh, passes three times over the field along the same line and builds a... a a ridge, if you like, of mounded soil about 60 centimeters high. Next slide. That's what it looks like three years later. That's Maluma on Dusa rootstock on the, in that same field. Uh, Andrew there, who is the son of the, the owner of the property, is about two meters high, so that gives you an idea. So proper soil preparation really does add a lot to the orchard. Irrigation. In your dry season, there, it is going to be possible, let me rephrase this, it is going to be possible in some of the areas I visited to do dry land avocados, but they would need to be started on irrigation. So the first two years to get the tree going in the dry season, you'd need to add supplemental irrigation. 
and then you could probably wean them off because there are areas in South Africa that are getting 180 centimeters of rain and then a three month or four month dry season. We're very successful at dry land avocado production. So you have plenty of those sorts of conditions here. So it is possible. I think you will need irrigation to get the trees started. And really, with these new technologies of micro-irrigation, it's really a choice between mini sprinklers and drippers. I've seen um, a very successful properties with drippers so far since I've been here. But uh, mini, mini sprinklers are also an option if you prefer that for maintenance. But uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Uh, wind protection. I don't think, so far, um, I'm not seeing any areas where wind has come up as an issue. I know in the monsoon you might get heavy wind. Uh, if you're on a very exposed upper site uh, that is prone to wind, you might need to add uh, some wind protection. Next, next slide, please. <clears throat> Traditionally in South Africa, we've used uh, casuarinas. As, as wind protection, boxwood, uh, but that has gone out of favor now because they compete with that first row. If you look on the right-hand side there, uh, that first row of trees will start declining because the casuarina roots are so competitive. Uh, there's also poplars which are used. Some of the poplar varieties work a little bit better. You may be able to use uh, grevillea, which are already used in the tea because those are available. The only issue I have with grevillea is it is a... Um, a host of, it's, it's resistant to Phytophthora, but it's a host of Phytophthora. So many of these Australian trees are hosts to Phytophthora, have co-evolved with Phytophthora. So they don't die, but they get sick. And I'm looking around at the grevilleas that are in the tea, I am seeing sick ones. So I, I suspect you do have Phytophthora in the grevillea, so it might not be the best if you need to put in a physical windbreak uh, to use. Next slide, please. Often what we do to get the tree going, uh, I'm in a very windy area, is we put these little uh, screens around the trees that's made of shade cloth. they recycled. So as we start each field, we use the same little screen in the next uh, plot. And that'll be on around the trees for a year until they settle in. And once they settle in, then they tolerate the wind quite well. But just that tender little tree that came out of the nursery is quite sensitive to wind. So we, we do this. It's, this is very common practice. And in very ser seriously windy areas now, um, all over the world, they're putting up artificial windbreaks like this. Enormously expensive. 80,000 rand per hectare. So that would be, it's, it would be 80 times 4 in rupees, to give you an idea. Uh, very, very, very expensive. That's the cost per hectare. And it's only happen happening in mature companies that have grown avocados now for many years and have been making a lot of money. The new farmers definitely cannot afford to build something like that. So I'm not recommending that for this, this, this time. In the early industry, I'm not seeing enough wind here, and I'm not hearing, aside from when, when the monsoon comes, you do have some wind, but that's wet wind. It's not, it, it, the wind we're protecting out here is dry, hot wind um, that causes the damage. Mulching and cover crops. So this tree is, is from the, 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 the forest, it, it likes a lot of organic material around it. Its, its roots grow up near the surface, 80% of avocado roots in the top 30 centimeters, and uh, so it likes organic matter. So any kind of organic matter that you can mulch around the trees is great. So, so this is a combination of ridging or mounding, mulching, and micro-irrigation to get the trees going. And this particular area that I'm showing you here uh, is high up in South Africa, 1,800 millimeters of rain, and this will end up being probably dry land farming in the end. The, the, the micro sprinklers will be taken out once the trees are established. <clears throat> this is, um, and Ken will talk some more about, this is up in India. This is the first trees that were planted. This is when they were a year old. This is a uh, reed on uh, Dusa. Um, growing very nicely with a cover crop to, to try and stabilize the soil during the monsoon. This particular cover crop is Pintoy peanut, which uh, was a local um, plant that we found there, but which is being used worldwide as a, a leguminous cover crop, very easy to manage and maintain. But we've, I think, moving now to using soybean as a cover crop, uh, which stabilizes the, the ridges very well. So during the heavy rain, 
doesn't let the, the raindrops hit the, the soil and seed, seal the soil and wash away the soil, holds the, the, the mound together. Just, it's just kept clear around the, around the tree. Then the, the soybeans are harvested by hand and the plants are then used as a mulch directly around the tree. Next slide, please. Here's, I guess, the, the, the take home message from this part of my talk. What a difference 50 years makes. So when I started in the California industry in 1984, the, the average yield, and you can go back and look at the California Avocado Commission website, it, it's, got, it's got the average yields for the industry each year. We're about seven tons per hectare. And a, a, the most outstanding grower, who was a guy called Ruben Hofschi at the time when I started off, was getting alternating between 11 and 15 tons per hectare, or 16 tons a hectare. And, and, and consistently getting 16 tons a hectare was unheard of. Now, with what we know and with the genetics that we have, it improved all, everything, all of, these, all of the school fees paid, if you like. I'm saying this again because I don't think we need to pay the, pay the school fees again in India. 16 tons is, is, a, is, a, is a good average. I mean, it really is. And it, if you look at all the industries, it's a, it's a, it's a reasonable average. And, it, and 33 to 35 tons per hectare is, is not unheard of. There's a researcher in, in California, I think I might have mentioned this, Dr. Carol Lovett, who has calculated that the, av the, the maximum sustainable yield is 30 tons per hectare. So you will get these years where you get to 33 or 35, but it'll jump back down to 23 or 25 the next year. But you're averaging in the high, in the high 20s. So it's, it's a completely new ball game now. And with back on farm prices being uh, averaging worldwide right now at, a, at around, for, for, for the good quality fruit, at around 25 rand, so 100 rupees a kilogram, it makes a huge difference financially if, you, if you're getting these high yields versus the seven, which used to be the acceptable norm. So we don't need to go back and start this industry at seven tons per hectare. It's, it just wouldn't make any sense, and it probably wouldn't be attractive to you guys as, as farmers to, 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 to plant avocado if that were going to be the case. So it's these incremental things that we've done. You know, the, 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 the germplasm, the climate, the, the, the mounding, the mulching, the proper nutrition, the proper irrigation, in the, at least in the beginning, to get the trees going, so that you end up with an even stand of trees that's highly productive. That's what, the, that's what it's about. So that, that's just a view. Uh, Ken's been to this, this particular orchard in South Africa. That's a new gem orchard. Um, so you can see all of the technologies employed there. This guy is a, a dairy farmer. He owns a, a, a very successful cheese uh, factory and dairy, which he sold, and now he's become an avocado farmer. And uh, he's done everything by the book, and I expect he'll do extremely well. I'm going to completely switch gears now. Next slide. And, and talk about nursery tree quality. Because this is going to be critical to the success of this, this industry in the beginning. And I would warn you there are going to be people who are going to uh, uh, take advantage of the industry in the early days uh, and set up uh, slapdash nurseries, cheap trees. There's no shortcuts with with producing a quality tree. And I really think your organization should be involved in ensuring that quality trees are delivered to the plantation industry from the beginning. And I'll talk about that um, uh, at, at a little bit here. But really it needs to be a, co a cooperative uh, arrangement that comes from this, this organization, government, the nurseries, and the growers themselves. You really want to establish a system that ensures Sorry, uh, let me. A system that ensures the selection, production, and distribution of disease free, true, true to type plant material of top quality. It could be in the form of a certification system for the, for the nurseries. But you guys got, have got an opportunity here to, to take control of things and make things right so that you don't distribute inferior 
material, particularly of the wrong germplasm or uh, carrying diseases. That, that would be, that's the, your, the worst possible scenario. Next slide, please. That's just a, a filler slide. Uh, next slide, please. So basic nursery responsibilities really are that the plant material is true to type, so that the, the mother blocks that they're getting the budwood from are certified varietals. Okay, that they're not something that somebody says they think it is, but is actually certified. The trees, are, trees that are supplied are disease-free, that quality meets, meets basic minimum standards, and the trees are ready for delivery within an agreed schedule. If you are, for example, pulling out or, or intercropping with tea and you have to take some rows out, and you've been told that your trees are going to be available in September, and then you discover that, they, no, it's not this September, it's, it's you know, June next year. That's enormously expensive for you. You've, you've lost months. You've lost a year of, of growth. So it's, it's important that, that the nurseries um, follow this. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so the so standard should ensure the sign and restock by wood and seed material is taken from approved and indexed trees. The trees should be selected for vigor, productivity, and health status and must be tested and certified avocado sunblotch viroid free. The worst silent disease of avocado, the worst disease, disease is definitely Phytophthora cinnamomai root rot. But the one that's going to catch this industry by surprise if we don't ensure clean material is going to be avocado sunblotch viroid. And this, I would bet anything, it's already in, the, in, the, in what we call the local varieties, these are West Indian types. Uh, they are classic um, um, asymptomatic carriers of the virus, um, particularly the tough ones. They've been selected for a long time as backyard trees uh, and often are, are contaminated. Um, the other thing that I would suggest uh, just quickly is growers should ensure that their individual nursery contract includes a provision to replace non-true to type trees. So if, for example, and this happens, uh, it, I'm a nurseryman myself, and this happened, has happened in my nursery, where I've sold a, 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 a farmer uh, maluma trees, which are high density trees, and one or two has have got mixed in because my guys in the nursery were sloppy. And I immediately, when I recognized that it's not maluma, replaced those two trees. That should be in the contract, and that can be negotiated with you and your nurseryman. Next slide, please. Sorry, sorry, back. <laughs> sorry. Okay, uh, there's, there's an example of true to type. That's, uh, <laughs> that's myself standing in the nursery at, uh, at Zambia, and you see I'm a different variety uh, to, to my friend standing next to me. Um, and, and that's kind of how it is with avocados. But uh, commercial avocado nurseries really should be off, able to offer you true to type, and I've given you lists there. I'm not going to run through them. Um, really, there's, there's, there, in, the, in the rootstocks, there's two technologies there. There's the clonal rootstocks, which I believe are sort of the pinnacle of, of technology with avocado rootstocks, and then the seedling lines of rootstocks, which are being used now already in, in Zambia, I mean, in, in India which aren't bad. Um, I, I would caution you, though, we don't n have enough information on the Israeli rootstocks yet uh, to know for sure that they're going to perform well in Indian conditions. They were selected for Israeli conditions. So Fairchild, Daganya, Ashdot were all selected under high salt, high heat, harsh conditions. Nothing like, um, uh, and, oh, and high pH soil conditions. Nothing like uh, Indian conditions. So uh, I'm not knocking the efforts being made by nurseries to get trees to growers of the best stuff that's available. And that is the best that has been available in India so far. But we will see the nurseries starting to produce clonal rootstocks in India soon. I'm convinced of that. And I'll work with, with uh, people in the industry to make sure that happens and provide the SOP to uh, uh, um, do the cultivation 
I think once you start producing clonal rootstocks in India, there will be no looking back. There will be none of the necessity to use the seedling rootstocks. Seedling rootstocks are inherently uneven because each one is genetically different. So even if it's a seedling line and even if it's claimed by parties, uh, uh, industries that oh, this seedling line works very well in our industry and it's very true to type, you and I both know y you, you may have married the most beautiful woman in the world and you're the most good looking guy. That does not mean your children are good looking and beautiful, right? <laughs> I'm not, I'm just using that as an example to drum it in. There is genetic variation in seedling population. Next slide, please. This just gives you an, a, 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 an idea of how bad it can be. This is my own farm, so I'm not pointing fingers at anybody else but myself. In the background there are the oldest trees, those Hass and Reed planted on random seedlings collected from the South African industry from an unscrupulous nursery. There was a 10-year waiting for list for trees on, on good rootstocks in South Africa, and the, the farm owner decided that he was going to buy these trees, and I advised him not to. I advised, when he did eventually buy them, I advised him not to plant them, but he did anyway. Look at the stand there. There's some big trees, some small trees, some gaps, and the field looks terrible. That field, those are the oldest trees receiving the same water and same fertilizer. The whole system on that farm runs together, so you can't cheat on it. The next is Hass and Reed on Dusa in year four. Look how even that stand is. There's a few gaps where trees have died, but the, the trees are beautiful. And then right here in the foreground is Maluma on Dusa year five that were planted just after those uh, West Indian seedling uh, rootstocks. That's for everybody to see. There is a risk in particularly planting seedlings of unknown origin. So there will be, uh, just simply because of, of the economics of it and, and the demand for trees, there will be unscrupulous uh, nurserymen that will appear selling all and everything to you. Trueness to type and good genetic material is, is required. Next, please. Okay, uh, the trees need to be disease-free. Um, oh, sorry, that's uh, uh, something that's been left there. But you need, you need to have some sort of a cert certification system. And really, you need the trees to be phytophthora root rot free coming from the nursery. That also is a certification system. A lab can easily check for you, randomly check trees in the nursery, and provide you a certificate and say, this nursery is phytophthora free. Next. Uh, these are just uh, a list of minimum tree standards. Um, I'm not going to read through them uh, with you, but it really means that the tree needs to follow certain criteria of, uh, of, um, of quality. You don't want to be planting a tiny tree with a crooked stem uh, looking sick. You need all the trees to be the same height, very good root systems, etc. Next. Uh, they really should be straight, have a good graft union that's smooth. Uh, the graft union mustn't be too close to the soil because you'll have problems of suckers coming out, but not too high either. And then you need to be a healthy stem diameter. I, I'm saying eight millimeters minimum uh, at the base, but bigger than that's even better. And branching shouldn't happen uh, until about uh, 30 centimeters up the, up the stem. Next, please. Uh, the tree should have at least two hardened off growth flushes, uh, at least 10 fully grown trees. Leaves should be dark, glossy, green, and healthy. Uh, there should be a record to show seed source material that is used for both the seedling rootstocks and the clonal rootstocks has been tested for sunblocks for the last two years. There must be a record to show that the sign material has also been tested for sunblock. Next, please. And then, of course, that uh, you should try and uh, negotiate with the nursery. And, and, and Ken, has, who's going to speak later, has been very, very uh, adept at doing this with the South African nurseries. He put them all on the spot. I find it quite amusing because they've never had somebody come and tell them, okay, if you don't deliver on time, we want 
to penalize you. We'll, so the price of the trees starts going down, right, Ken? If they, if they miss the delivery date. And it's amazing how well it's worked. <laughs> Next slide, please. Thank you. I, I, I'm not sure how we, are we going to wait for the panel to, to, do, to field questions. So there's lots of new learnings for all of us. You've uh, flagged a few critical areas, such as uh, quality of the plant and the rootstock. Uh, Guy has been traveling over the last few days to all to rubber country, as well as some of the tea growing districts. And after today, he will be visiting uh, the Anamales and, and Munar and Vandi Periyar as well. And, and uh, you know, over these next few years where avocado planting in plantations is in its infancy, we hope to have more interactions with him. Uh, yesterday, somebody was talking about, you know, maybe organizing a trip to South Africa to see what avocado plantations are like. So these are discussions that we can, uh, we can have. Uh, we will now break for a, a short while to have some refreshments and, and regroup in about 15 minutes. Thank you.